is called Return to Neverland or Finding Neverland. And wh what I want to do before I start this, um, I, I want to make sure that when I draw a parallel to this movie that I'm about to talk about in the Word of God, that in no way, shape, or form do you conclude that I'm drawing this conclusion that the movie, which is fictional, fable, whatever you might call it, I am not drawing a parallel that the word of God is fictional or a fable, right? So make sure we, that we do not think that in our head because here's why, is that it is the power of God unto salvation in this book, right? There are people that have mental illness that have been healed because of the word of God. There are families that have been brought together because of the word of God. There are people that have been raised from the dead because of the word of God. There are people that have been, their bodies have been healed of cancer because of the word of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? So this, ladies and gentlemen, is not a fable and is not a fictional book. Amen? So before we go any further, I don't want to forget that we have an online family that's watching today, and can we let them know we are so glad you guys are here. Well, let me, let me set the stage. Uh, some of you might or might not have seen this particular movie, so I have to set the stage for the video, 30-second video that I want to play. It's from a movie called Hook. Anybody here seen, seen the movie? Anybody here, a few of you, a number of you? Well, how many of you have heard of Peter Pan? Anybody in here heard of Peter Pan? All right, some of you, some of you not. So to kind of set the stage, it was Return to Le uh, Neverland is what the movie was called, or it was Hook, and it's when Robin Williams, who's an actor, who used to be Peter Pan, and he hung out with the Lost Boys in a place called Neverland. Now, we're all lost boys and lost girls at some level, aren't we? We're all that way at some level. But he hung out with the lost boys, and he became an adult. So he was no longer Peter Pan, and he became an adult. And because of the cares of this world, being married and having children and having a job and having to pay mortgages and being in charge of things... He became what they called the lost boys, his friends, when they saw him. They said, Peter, you have turned into a pirate. You no longer are a child. You are a pirate. And he became a, a, a pirate. So I'm going I'm to blend this together in just a moment. But if we can, they're setting at the table in this video... Peter, who's now an adult, used to be Peter Pan, is sitting with his childlike friends, and they have no food on the table. And because of that, they used to imagine and, and let their minds be free, and they would trust, and they would believe. And Peter himself had went back, and he's an adult, and he no longer can do any of those things. And they're sitting at the table, and something happens. So if we could go ahead and roll that video. Doing it. Doing what? Using your imagination, Peter. You're playing with us, Peter. You're, You're doing, doing it, Peter. Look, you know what it seems. So Peter started imagining. He started trusting. He became as a child again. So I want to have a, con I want to have a conversation today and ask this question in our conversation. Have you become a pirate when it comes to God and his word? Has experiences and emotions and things that have happened in your life, have you become a pirate 
when it comes to the very word of God. Well, let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. And we've heard this scripture many times. So what I want you to do today is to lean in, lean in, lean in, give some energy, unfold your hands, take a deep breath, because already with experiences in your life, you know, some of you might say, oh, they played a secular movie in the church. How can the church even be blessed to let that in the house of God? And I will very quickly remind you that this is not God, that we house the very spirit of God. So we are the church. So anything that you let in and out of your life has to do with that, not what we did in here, but more what we do outside of here. Can I get an amen? amen. Too many times we just, that this building becomes this holier than thou. The only reason why it is brick and mortar. I'm going to preach for just a minute. Is that okay? Listen, listen, church, we got to get this. This is a building. If we close this tomorrow, it could become a strip club. It could. No, listen, y'all, I'm not joking. This is a building that has brick, mortar, uh, uh, drywall, paint. It has a ceiling. What makes it the very house of God is when two or more are gathered in my name and they come in here, that's when there is power. It's because of the spirit of God that lives in us that brings it in here. Are you getting that, right? So it isn't this building, right? That, had, that was not even in my notes, but I, I just had to say it. Is that all right? Amen. All right. Well, we're going to go back to reading Matthew 18. I'm going to start in verse 1. And uh, we're going to go through 2 through 4. But it says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, I want to stop right there because I want you to know something. He's not talking about heaven. Why? Because it would be a silly question that when you go to heaven and there's a God, almighty, holy of holies, king of kings, lord of lords, to ask the question, who's the greatest? Because the question is God. It's not us. So that's not the question they're asking and we'll see what they're, what they're really asking. They're saying, who's the greatest? And so Jesus, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. So I'm going to stop right there. I've never seen this before. Jesus called a little child to him. And the child came. It was the first experience of Jesus calling someone and them saying, okay, you see, if you were a young child and some guy in his 30s goes, hey, man, come here for a minute, you'd be like, I don't think so. I'm out. This is the first time we read that Jesus calls a little child like this, and it was the experience of the little child saying, okay, I'll listen to you. And he placed them in the middle of these men that asked the question. And he said, truly I tell you, Unless you change and become like a little child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of the child is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Kind of like Peter Pan. To draw a little bit of the parallel, they were children. They believed See, unless we become as a child, how many of you know that when you were a child, some of you when you were younger, if you can remember way back, I mean, I can remember, um, you know, school just let out. Is it the greatest time in the world if you're a child? Not if you're a parent, <laughs> but if you're a child. Because school's out, man. I mean, you know, Alice Cooper wrote a song about it. Some of you young people are like, who in the world? What, what's her name? Alice have to do with it. <laughs> School's out. And you know a kid, they go to bed and they get up every morning and it's a new day. What could happen today? 
I remember being a kid, getting on my bike, and some of you can remember this. I'd get up in the morning, and if it was raining, I'd be bummed because I couldn't go outside. And then I would whine and cry, and then my mom would say, if you keep whining and crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. And I'd be like, ah. And so when it was nice, though, I would hop on my bike, and the day was mine. You know, we need to be like that again as adults, to just get up. Your feet hit the ground, and you're like, God, what do you have for me today? What can I get into today? Rather than get up, and, and I know your body hurts, so does mine. You get up, it's a little different. Your feet hit the ground, and you have to take an assessment of everything for a second. And you're like, ah, okay. It's what I do when I get up. Because I know I'm going to start moving, but I want to make sure I don't break a hip or pull something. <laughs> but then I'm ready to go. Because in the spirit of God that raises up inside of me like a child because I don't know what the day brings and it becomes an adventure like a child and I know that God's word has something for me and those around me and my family because I just believe and I just trust. I'm back to Neverland, the kingdom of God. See, Jesus said you won't even see the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is this. The word kingdom in that particular scripture, in the Greek, typically means this, not to be confused <clears throat> with an actual kingdom. So it's not talking about heaven. But rather, don't be confused with an actual kingdom, but rather the right, the authority, the dominion, the kingship over a kingdom or territory. What that simply means so that we can just water it down, it has to do with what's within you in the spirit of God with your mind, your will, and your emotions. How many of you would like to have authority over that territory? Your mind, your will, three of you. Perfect. I'm going to preach to you three. Four. Okay. Your mind, your will, and emotions. We live in a world that that is running rampant and people are just crazy. We're, we really are. I'm not confessing anything, but, but we're a mess at times. And it's because we don't have control. Authority that God has given us over the kingdom of God that is within you. Jesus talked about it constantly. The kingdom of God is within us. It's within us. It's a territory that we've got to guard, but we have dominion over it in the name of Jesus. But we must be like a child and trust God because our experiences will tend to rule us. And I'll show you how. Luke chapter 10, 19, we're not going to go there, but I'm going to give you some things. Jesus said, I give you authority. Jesus said, I give you authority. Everyone say authority. Authority, authority. It, it's, it's a big thing, right? They're, they're in charge. They have authority. When a highway patrolman pulls you over, puts the hat on, he has authority, and you know it, or at least you should. It's not going to go well for you, but here's why. Because he knows, she knows, they have authority, and you're confused. You do not. The other one is John 10.10. 10 which is what this church is called, More Life Church. Jesus said this, I came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. Part of our thinking process is, is different day, same old crap. You ever said that? It's the Monday blues. I don't like Mondays. Again, different day. Same old garbage. Huh. Well, that's different than what the Word of God says. 
Because the word of God says that if you are a believer, Jesus himself said that I came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. And everyone say today. Today. Let's say it again. Today. I said, so we're going to have a conversation, which means I'm not the only one talking. I'm going to ask you to be part of the conversation. Is that okay? Otherwise, it's just me listening to me. And I'm not, don't like that personally. It's just, you know, and neither does my wife, just note to self. So we'll have that conversation. Jesus said you would have life and you would have it more abundantly today. Too many times as believers, we're just that cat hanging on. It says Friday's coming. That poster that some people have that hang in there, Friday's coming. I don't know what happens difference on Friday, but I used to say to my wife and myself, why can't the weekend feel like, I mean, why can't Monday feel like the weekend? It can, ladies and gentlemen. It can. If you walk in the newness of life that Jesus Christ has given us, right? Yes, thank you. See, that's communicating. So I, here's a point that I really want to get across, that studies have shown that by the age and remember, we're talking about being a child again. By the age of 19 to 23, something happens in our brains. Uh, science. <clears throat> we become skeptical based on our emotions and experiences. And our brains change. Let me give you a few examples. If you're a young man that's 16 years old and you own a pickup truck, especially if you go to Valley, you, it's part of the pre-whatever, you, you have to have a pickup truck. And if you have a pickup truck and you're 16 years old and you get it and you're all excited and somebody goes, dude, I hear you got a pickup truck. You're like, yeah, you ought to see it. I did this to it. I got that. I got that. Now, Let's shift the script. You're now 23, and somebody says, hey, do you own a truck? And you're like, no, I'm not helping you move. <laughs> <clears throat> what happened? Experiences. He's 16. His brain says, this is awesome. By the time he's 23, his experiences says, no, I'm not helping you move. I know what you want. Let me give you another one if you don't think it's true. So you're a girl, 14 years old. You have your nice dress on. You come to church. Somebody says, you look really nice. And you're like, oh. <laughs> thank you. You're 23, and some dude says, hey, you look really nice. And you're like, weirdo. Why? Experience. Experiences change the way we think. Last one. I have to use my grandson. Uh, when he was young, uh, we, we have Alexa. You know, the Alexa little thing in your home, right? And we would say, Alexa, play a song. It was, you know, good music. It was a Christian song, so don't judge me if you think I was playing Hell's Bells or something, but uh, that's only when I work out. But So he would, he would try it when he was young, and he would go, he would say, Alexa, Alexa, play white, shine white. And Alexa would go, I'm sorry, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> and he would go, Alexa. Play white, shine white. I'm sorry. I don't know what you're saying. I can't understand you. And he would go, ah. So what I'm telling you and all that, he'll never, ever marry a girl named Alexa. That's, that's. <laughs> our minds and our emotions with experiences, the, our minds associate our emotions, you might want to write this down, that our minds associate our emotions with experiences, pain, and or 
pleasure. If we are not careful, here's what happens. We will not trust God or others by only an experience. If we're not careful, we put God and his word, this word, this word, we put it in a box due to our own experiences and disappointments. Well, I prayed for somebody and they didn't get healed. Well, therefore, then I guess the word is not true. I asked God to give me a new job and I didn't get it. Well, then I, I guess that the word of God is just not true. See, our experiences will determine in our life whether or not we become childlike and we trust the word of God regardless. Ladies and gentlemen, experiences are important. They're very important. They help us to grow and they teach us many things. Well, Larry, you don't understand. You know, I've experienced this and I've experienced that. I'm absolutely, uh, I do understand that and I agree with you and likewise, so have I. But we can't allow our experience to be a one and done and that's just the way it is forever and I will never, ever, ever trust again because what that causes you to be is jaded and the word jaded, one of the, one of the, the words and definitions of is you become bored. So when you hear something about the word of God, you check out, you become bored, you don't trust it, nor do you believe it. I've heard that before, I'm checking out, you are now jaded because we do not have childlike faith. You see, childlike faith is simply this. When I would ask my daughter to jump off of a, the trampoline and I would catch her, she would do it. Now, there are some differences. She might not do that now that she's a little older and I'm a lot older. But when she was a child, she knew that I would catch her. My son and my daughter knew that when I told them that I would do something, they knew I would do it. See, there was trust. Somewhere along the line, we become pirates with the word of God. And because the experience did not go well, it's hard for us to trust. Well, I'm going to get us out of this. How do, how do we fix that? And remember, there's nothing wrong with our experiences. So you're going to want to write this down. If you're taking notes, I'll go slow. It's not up on the screen. I believe we should consult our experiences. I believe that we should consult our experiences, but never let them rule you. We should consult our experiences, but never let them rule you or you truly will be jaded. Our emotions are how we live and die. Matthew chapter 16. Um, it's 16, 19, but, but I want to read. Um, this just jumped right out at me. I mean, the word of God. How many of you know the word of God? It, it's the power of life and death. How many of you know that? It just is. In this, it is literally the power of life and death. It's not fiction. It's not a fable. It's not a fairy tale. It is truth and life. Jesus is asking his disciples who other people say he is. And in verse 15, it's not up there and that's fine. But he, he asks Peter, he says, Peter, what about you? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say today? You're sitting here. You know, there's, there's, how many of you know we don't meet just to meet, right? Or this just becomes a club. It just becomes a scenario where, again, I went to a building. Let me check a box. 
Just if that's what we do, honestly, I, I personally, and I want to, I want to find out by a show of hands, how many of you would rather just stay in bed, right? I would if I'm just coming here to check a box. No, I want to come to church and be part of something bigger than me, see what God is doing. It, it is a place where I can go get rejuvenated. Like It's like a workout where you just, these endorphins get flowing and I get around other believers. And I start hearing testimonies of what God is doing in their lives. And some people that are here, they need prayer. They're like, I need help. Listen, this is also a hospital. This isn't a place where everybody, everything's going great because there's people sitting in chairs today that their life is not going great. Is that fair to say? Is this not? They're here going, I'm checking a box and I left the same stinking way I came. If that's what we do, I'm out. I personally would rather go to the gym. I feel better when I leave the gym then. But it's not true because I come here because I know when other believers come, the presence of God is here. And when the praise and worship team gets up, I don't know about you all, but I'm ready to honor God who saved me. I, was, I had death. I was going to hell. And he took me out of death, hell, and the grave. And he called me into his marvelous life. And I will never, ever, ever forget that my whole life. I'm not a pirate. I'm just not going to forget. I mean, it's exciting. You know, I, I remember, this is not in my notes, that, but I remember, it's fair to share this. I remember getting saved. And I remember other believers around me and non-believers because how many of you know that I'm an emotional guy? I don't hide feelings a whole lot, good, bad, or indifferent. And when I got saved, I used to be crazy when I was unsaved. Just crazy, drinking, running, having fun. And here's what I want you to know. When I got saved, other than the drinking, carousing, and doing that stuff, it all, I stayed the same. I was just as crazy. I was telling people about Jesus. My life was changed. And I had, how can a man take fire into his bosom and not be consumed? And it's constantly, you feed that fire, you keep your childlike faith. I get up every day. I'm not a unicorn. It's because of Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. I'm not anything great. It's the very presence of God that lives, gives me breath. I sin all the time. Ask my family and wife. But there's a difference that happened in my life that I went from hell to heaven, death to life, and I get excited about that. I, I do. I mean, it's a big deal because this word is true. We live in a world that needs a hope, that needs hope. You've got it. I've got it. And we have too many secret agent Christians. We got too many secret agent Christians. We got to tell the world what God has done for me, for you. But if you don't know what he's done for you, remember we've heard it said, you can't know what you don't know. And if you've experienced God, you know his goodness. You know his goodness. And people would tell me, ah, it's a phase, Larry. Get over yourself. You're excited. One day you'll be like me, a pious gas bag. I'm like, no, I, I don't want to be like you. You look like you've been sucking on sour grapes, dude. I thought Jesus set you free. How? I'm going to say it again. How can a man take fire into his bosom and not be consumed? Now, wait a minute. There's people sitting here and go, well, that's just not me. Who said? When did somebody tell you that that is not you? Because when God consumes some, something, y'all, he just consumes it. Somewhere along the line, you've told yourself, I'm not an emotional person. 
I, I, I'm done. I'm going to get off that soapbox. I got to get this scripture. Holy Spirit, thank you. He said, Larry, stop. I said, yes, sir. Ha. <laughs> Where were we? Matthew 16, 19. Hallelujah. Y'all having fun? All right, I am. We can have fun. God wants us to have fun. Well, he asked Simon, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Skip down to verse 19. Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What the keys to the kingdom of heaven. We have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. How many of you know that we don't need keys to get into heaven? Right? I, I don't have any. I mean, the key is to know Jesus, right? There's only one way to get to heaven. Jesus said it's through, through me. No man comes to the Father but through me. We know that, but he gives us the keys to the kingdom that is the spiritual realm, our mind, our will, and our emotions where we live and in this world. And it's important to have these keys. And this is what Jesus said to, to, said to them. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, God heals the brokenhearted. God sets the captive free. There's a narrative in the world that this is a fable. It's been reduced. It's been bullied. It's been pushed around. It's been a fad. It's, we've seen preachers fall. Well, hey, nothing new. David was the king of that. Come on, somebody. David was the king of that. And yet, his stuff's in here. Well, what about, you know, this preacher? You see, I had an experience. I went to this church, and they changed the color of the carpet, and they didn't even ask me. I know, that's a horrible experience. I get it. Well, the pastor's been doing a series, and, well, I, I don't really like the music. They've kind of been on this flow. Listen, I, I, how many of you want to grow? Right? But how many of you know that in the gym, in order to grow, you got to push a little bit, you got to add another plate, you got to do another rep, you got to keep it going, and it's going to be a little bit of painful, you might be sore and it's going to hurt. So I want you to grow. Here's what I want you to know. This is important for us to grow, is that it's not about me, it's not about this pastor, it's not about how you feel when you walk in, it's not about a feeling. It's not about the beautiful building. It's not about the signs they hold in the out, on the outside. It's not about the greeter team. It's not about the parking team. It's not about Pastor Josh, Pastor Angie, Pastor Daniel leading music. It's not about the children's ministry. We get hung up on all of those things as an experience. And my question is, what's your experience with Jesus Christ? How's it going in your life with Jesus Christ? Here's why. Those things and those emotions are going to fail you. You're going to come in one day and you're going to be ticked off because somebody did something in here and you're going to be like go to another church. And typically here's what I've seen. Can I just be honest? We're growing. Is that okay? You don't go anywhere. Those of you watching online, those of you that, that are here, you just end up going nowhere because of an experience that you had, and you attached this emotion and this feeling that all pastors are bad, all churches are bad, all people are bad, they're hypocrites, I'm not going to go anymore, and somewhere along the line, you've left God out of the equation of all of that because of our emotions. Let's get back to being like children, loving one another, caring for one another, amen? I mean, let's just get back to being children again and trusting. Daniel, if you could come and if you could help me out on the, on the keyboards, I'm going to close. <clears throat> so what do we do? What do we do? I probably yelled at you enough today. What, what do we do from here? Where do we go? What do we do? How do we get out of this hole? 
I love you guys. Thank you so much. Where do we go? Well, let's start with this. I have two things. Number one, probably many things we can do, but let's start with one. Number one, we ask God to restore to us his great salvation. See, here, this is a funny thing in, in the church we live in today. You know, I believe this. I'm old school. <clears throat> Hear this online. Hear this on video if someone's watching. Hear this right now. Until I can get someone lost, I can't get them saved. I'm going to say it again. Because we dress up, we come in, I'm good. I'm not saying you're not good. But until you can come to the point of your own life, and I'll never forget mine, I heard a man preach, and he talked about hell. And he talked about sin. And he talked about people were separated from God that didn't know God. But we've all seen it, football games, sporting events, John 3, 16. But God sent the only thing he had one of, his son, that whoever believes in him would be saved. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn, but to condemn the world, but that through him, the world, which is us, might be saved. I knew I was lost. I knew I was far from God. I knew he created me. I was mad because of my own life. I was angry. But I heard God. I became like a child. I'm going to give God a chance. I'm going to trust him. And I often go back like David. And we're closing with this scripture. <clears throat> In Psalm 51, <clears throat> the prophet Nathan had come to David after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. David messed up. He had a man murdered and he had committed adultery. And this is what David said. He said a lot of things. In verse 12, Psalm 51, 12. First and 11, he said, do not cast from me your presence. You see, the absence of God, what makes hell, hell? Well, I need you to think about this for a minute. Even on this earth, it might seem like hell to you, but yet the presence of God is still here. In hell, the very presence of God, it cannot remain there. There is no presence of God. David said, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Here's what he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. God, restore my joy when I first gave my life to you. When I realized that I was a sinner and I needed you. Restore that because it can become the same old, same old, same building, same job, same place, same things, same pastor, same Bible, same music, and it can become so redundant that we forget like David, man, I was lost, now I'm found. Oh my God, restore, restore, restore that joy. That's the first thing that we want to do. Secondly, very simple, you've heard it a million times. Seek God first in everything you do. Business decision, going to get married, going to buy a car. Where am I going to live? How do I raise my kids? 
What do I do at work tomorrow? God uh, <clears throat> quickened me. And this is just for me, and maybe not you. I would get up in the morning, feet hit the ground, I'm ready to go, I'm excited, I love life. I don't know why. I don't know, maybe my life just sucked when I was a kid. I don't know, but I'm living it now, and I'm having fun. And I get up, and first thing in the morning, first thing I would do is I would open up and start checking emails. First thing, grab my coffee, check it out, see, let's, you know, let's see what I got to do. And I kept, kept hearing this small voice. Hey, probably should start with me. Hey, hey, probably should start with me. Hello, good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, no, I, I'm kind of busy, God. I got, I got a lot of stuff. I just, I just want to get ahead of it. Be a whole lot easier with me. And I found myself getting into the day without him, trying to play catch up. And it looked basically like this. Oh, God. Help. Oh, shoot. Oh, snap. Anger, frustration, emotions got ahead of me. Then I was doing more apologizing. Sorry. Uh. And God's like, hello, start with me. Ask God. If you know Jesus today, ask God to restore your salvation and the joy of that. Seek him first before you do anything. And when I started doing that, and that didn't mean I spent an hour in the Word and praying. I wish I could tell you that, but I did not. I'm not that spiritual or religious. I would just go, hey, God, good morning. I love you, Lord. Thank you for being part of my life today. I'm excited about today. God, protect my family. Protect me. Give me wisdom and words to help change a lost and dying world that I'm in. Please have my eyes to be opened. Send people in my path that I can help share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Please, Lord, let me be ready and open to that. And honestly, man, my eyes were open and the days got easier. Guys, we have to make plans. We have to make plans. You have to be intentional with the things of God. There's an interesting date, January 15th. It's an interesting date because it's the cutoff date. Studies show this to be true. January 15th is the cutoff date. See, I should have had a sippy cup. <laughs> January 15th is the cutoff date where 95% of New Year's resolutions stop and fail. What? January 15th. You probably don't start January 1st because people are still hungover eating, watching football games. <laughs> it's not the starting day. It's like January 2nd. So it's two weeks. And in two weeks, 95% of resolutions to resolve something have stopped. Here's what I submit to you today. See God first. Ask him to restore the joy of your salvation. Come to church. Bring someone to church with you. See God first in the morning, and your life will never be the same. Have you ever felt like God doesn't hear you? That your voice hits the ceiling like the heavens are closed? I've felt that way too. Hello. My name is Josh Pennington, and I would love to share with you how I navigated the dry seasons of life in my brand new book called When the Heavens Seem Closed. You can get this book anywhere that books are sold, online or at morelifechurch.com. I would love for you to plan a visit to worship with us any Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. at More Life Church.